And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Resurrection Church. Morning. Morning. Well, you know, hey, I'm Pastor Steve. I'm the pastor on mission today, and I'm bringing with me today another pastor on mission, uh, Dave Chapness, who you may or may not know, but Dave has served in this community for over 30 years over at River Lakes Church, one of our uh, fellow churches in town that we partner with on a lot of occasion. Uh, his last 13 years there, he was senior pastor or lead pastor, as they refer to him. But as he left that ministry, he joined a ministry called COG, and it's a ministry for um, uh, orphans in Zambia. And uh, he was stolen away from that by his current position as president of International Christian Ministry. Uh, but Dave has a family. He has children, six of them, by the way, nine grandchildren, which I know that's special for him. Uh, for us old guys, our grandchildren are the apples of our eyes, and I know they are for him as well. Uh, but even with that, he stays on mission. Uh, and you're going to hear about that today. Um, he lives here in Bakersfield. He also suffers for Jesus over in Los Osos sometimes. Uh, so keep that from my wife. Don't let her hear that. Uh, but anyway, so I introduce to you uh, my good friend, uh, Dave Chapness. Hey, thank you. Hey, Rez Church. Are you guys uh, ready to get after it? Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, honored really, thanks for uh, just collectively getting together to not only worship but to take in from the Lord what he has and I hopefully we'll do that. We're going to go through a text of scripture, if you ha hey thanks, um, uh, so if you have a Bible we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but let me just tell you a little bit, set it up, we'll try to have a conversation, I'm going to give you some information, so for you to have feedback, you know I go to different churches and like when I'm, I'm in some of my friends who have a black church, they talk back, right? They talk to, they talk to me, and they'll say, you know, come on, so, or, or mm-hmm, and take it, you know, go, and they'll, they'll do that, or they'll say, help him, Jesus. I don't, I don't want to hear any of that today, <laughs> but they do sometimes. Or if you're in a, a Japanese church, you know, they, have a, they actually have a thing, the way they talk back, and, hmm, hi, whoa. You know, and they do, they officially do that, right? So if you, whatever you feel like, if I hear a little whoa over, that really helps me. Just talk back and forth and we'll go through it. Now, I, I uh, became a Christian when I was 20 years old. I grew up in this town. My father grew up in this town. His father was the sheriff of this town in 1935 to 1939. I tried to leave when I went to college, was moved away for eight years, spent some time in the Navy and then down in Southern California. I became a Christian right then. And when I did, I said to the Lord at some point, hey, I'll go anywhere in the world you want me to go, only I'm not going back to Bakersfield. <laughs> Just a warning, don't ever pray that way. Right? Because he's going to say, well, what's most important? Where you do or not want to go or me? So what happens is he challenges the things that we hold on to. And, and I'm so grateful for that. As people, especially in this town, are unique. Right? And uh, good, good, great relationship. So happy to to be here and to be with you guys and be a part of it. Now, I did uh, become a pastor, and I never thought I would be a pastor, never wanted to be a pastor. Never, I just thought, you know, that's for somebody else. Uh, but it was it had to do with people and, and just praying and talking to the Lord and saying, do you, you want me to keep doing this? It, it's basically not for others. He was like saying, yeah, you need to do this. We, we, I need to keep working on you. And then he used that and used the, the foolishness and weakness of my own life to help feed other people. And that's what he wants to do for you. So part of what we're going to talk about, not, not that you all are going to become pastors, but he puts us in places where he uses us, and sometimes they're unusual. So I stepped out of that role as the lead guy there, um, went back to work for a family business for a little bit, and then stepped into this place where I was working with orphans in Zambia. That was great fun. Never done anything like it. You know, and uh, learned a lot. And then um, uh, International Christian Ministries is a ministry that has been around for 33 years. It actually started here. Matter of fact, it started out of the church that 
that I came from, which was at the time not River Lakes, it was called Fruitvale Community Church, and we had a missionary couple that came out of there, Phil and Debbie Walker, and we sent them to Israel. And they went to Israel for a little less than 10 years, or about 10 years, and they, uh, because they, they lived in a kibbutz, they shared Christ with people, non-believers that were there, and because they were effective, the government invited them to leave the country. So they had to, they had to go, and uh, they didn't know where they were going to go. So they ended up on the west side of Kenya. Kenya is a, a nation in the kind of green belt of Africa on the east part of the continent. Kitali is a town that's up about 6,200 feet, real pleasant, nice area. And they landed there, which is on the west side of that nation, or close to, right close to Uganda. Just started ministering to people, saw people come to know Christ reached a young man uh, who was a Sabot, which was a tribe of people that lived on Mount Elgon. If you haven't heard of Mount Elgon, it's where the, the, the elite world Kenyan runners train. It goes up to about 12,000 feet. It's a large mountain base, but not, it's, that's about its peak, about 12. Um, he was one of the first believers from the Sabot people to come to Christ. Worked in a small group with several others. Phil and Myron, the two who started ICM, discipled them worked with them. He's now our national director in Kenya. Where there was no gospel on that mountain, now there are churches, and we have a seminary there. We train people, and we worked with Wycliffe, and the Bible had been translated there. It's amazing to see the transformation. Yeah, it's a really cool thing. I wish I could take you guys there and see it. We, uh, we have people growing coffee. We do things called a widow's acre where we deal with widows. Who there's a, There was a lot of conflict on that mountain. It was a dangerous place to go for a while. And so we work with helping provide for them, train for them, make, help them become self-sufficient. But we're in 25 nations. There's 55 nations in the continent of Africa. So if you just look at the whole continent, across that green band, which is called the sub-Saharan band or strip, we're in almost all of those, many of the small ones in, uh, in West Africa. And, and really our whole purpose, why we exist, what we funnel, there's so many good ministries and things to do, but what we funnel all our attention in is that we exist to serve the church by equipping and discipling its leaders, its pastors. So many rural pastors who have no biblical education, have no theological education, have nobody who's walked alongside of them to disciple them. To help train them and so they mix kind of their cultural animistic beliefs with the Bible or the or some prosperity gospel that comes in and teaches them because somebody came by and said this is how you do it and so it gets a little confusing for them they're hungry for the gospel you know why because more people are coming to Christ on the continent of Africa than anywhere other continent in the world right now today yeah. and but the question is how are they coming to Christ and what kind of believers are they so much distortion so the way that we do that is by helping equip the leaders, and they are reaching hundreds of thousands, much more, much more rapidly than, than we, come, we can. We have one of our staff members who goes, who goes right here, comes to the downtown campus, Mel Fox. Mel, are you in here? Where's Mel? He was out greeting. There he is right there. Stand up, Mel. I'll make, um, point you out. And, yeah. He's a, Uh, Mel will be in the back at the table. You can talk with him, but he's, uh, he's part of the church here, here and his wife, Jerry. And, and uh, Mel is our director of projects and short-term missions. So, you know, it's dangerous to get to know him because we'll drag you over there. And uh, it's a lot of fun, though. I mean, it's just to see what God does. So let's dive into the text a little bit. And then I want to walk through. And at the end of it, we'll talk a little more about what we see God is doing and, and the nature of the gospel itself. This is not going to be anything new, but I mean, as we kind of hammer back on the basics, um, it, it, uh, it becomes important. Because this is what, this is the foundation of our faith. And it really is wrapped up in the gospel, the good news. That God in his, in his creation created us to be his image bearers, but that we went afoul. So from the very beginning, God planned to send his own son. Part of the Godhead to come down, God, fully God and fully man who took on all our sins and died on a cross, and he made him to be sin on that cross, that we might become the righteousness of God. If you think about that, like, why did Jesus come? Why did he come for 33 years? If he, if he came to die for you, if he came here to die for you, why didn't he just come on a Friday? Get everybody mad at him, 
get on the cross, die on the cross, be raised on the third day and go back. Job done. You're all forgiven. What were the 33 years about? Let me give you a clue. Jesus said this, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. You know why all that 33 years about? Because he lived the life you should have lived. I should have lived. It was perfect. He was without sin. We were not made to sin. We were made to be this shining glory of God's creation. But we are stained and we are marked and we are utterly fallen. So at the same time in Galatians 5, 21, and we're, we're not going to spend time in there, but it just says he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, took our sin, so now that we're forgiven, that we might become the righteousness of him. So it's what we call the great swap, right? He took our sin. He gave us his perfect life. So when Jesus, when God sees you now as a believer, he doesn't see all the failure. He's aware of it. He's not... He's not dumb, but he sees Jesus. See, you're positionally made right. Let me ask you a question. Do you practically live that way? So what I want to share with you this morning is the unstoppable motivation. This unquenching motivation to live a missional life. To be Jesus, to let Jesus reign in you on this earth until he takes you home. So let's look at... 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm just going to read verses 14 and 15. We're not going to go into all of it this morning. There's a lot here. And I'll refer to a little bit of part of the other part of the text. But let's read it together. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this. That one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he, Jesus, died for all. That those who live might no longer live for themselves, uh, but for him whom for their sake died and was raised. Father, would you unpack this, not just in our mind, but in our heart, would it capture our will? Maybe we've heard it many times before. Maybe these are basic things, but I wake up in the morning and I'm so grateful for this truth. And my life is in your hands. And there's no better place to be. Let it transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're just, this is, you know, how do you, this idea that we're on a mission. How many of you are, um, and, and this actually came from Mel. We were talking about this. How many of you are missionaries that are in here? How are you missionary, missionaries in here? Got, you got a few? Okay, well, we'll that's going to change by the end. Okay, so if I didn't, don't ask about it, tell me. All right, but we have this mission that's been given to us. Otherwise, let me ask you another what, why question. You know, why is it that when Jesus, we, you come to Christ, I think, why did he leave me here? I know where it's better. You know where it's better, right? Are there some days, I'm not talking about, you know, depression giving up your life, but, I, but some days I just think about it, I go, wow, I, I'm ready. Come back. I, I'm, I'm good, because this world doesn't hold anything of ultimate value. It holds, there's beauty, there's relationships, there's satisfaction to be gained, but not like, not like with him, where the scripture says, in your presence there is joy evermore. Who's for that? I am, right? So why am I here? Why does he leave us here? Well, he tells us why, basically. He says, the Father has sent me, I'm now sending you. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. Turn the world upside down. Go to the one who's lost, whose mind is closed, but I'm going to open it. And you don't even know. But don't hold back. Preach the gospel to all creation. Let them hear of it. And I'll be with you always. And in the process, I'll change you. Don't do it. What we think is change is not real change. We just kind of modify our life and manage our sin. But how about seeing that sin start to die away and not modify your life, but see it magnified? 
That, that's a whole change. So what does that? What becomes that motivation? It's in the first part of this verse. But the love of Christ controls us, he says. You might have a version that says compels us. In, in the language of that word is it's something that hems us in, that holds us, that binds us, that won't let us go to the right or to the left, that it keeps us in this place. The love of Christ binds us. It controls us. It won't let me go anywhere else other than I love people, lost people who don't know him yet. Why? Because he loved me. This verse is not saying the love, my love for God compels or controls us. It's his love for us that overwhelms me. When I became a believer, it was the hardest thing for me to imagine, but it was the greatest thing that sunk into my mind. I, I, I just remember thinking, somebody sharing John 3.16 with me. At 20, living here in conservative San Joaquin Valley. I never heard it. I guess I never heard it. And it sunk in. And I said, that is too good to be true. But I found myself on my knees saying, God, if that's true, I'm giving you my life. I want what you're offering. And I didn't have miraculous change overnight, but I saw things start to change slowly. And one of the things that grew over time was this little love for other people. Now, I didn't have hardly any at all. Probably none, except for myself. But that started to change. So what happens is this love of God will capture you, right? The love of Christ controls us. So what is our motivation for living? Why should I go out of my way? Why should I to, to take the gospel to the lost like he did? I came to seek and save the lost. He said, so the, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. You don't save anybody, but guess who's in you who does? And do, if you're like me and, and spent years just waiting for God to set up the per perfect circumstance and kind of get it, you know, the Lord kind of whispering in you, this is the one, forget it. I mean, I step out in fear. I just did it the other day. I, was, I had to go get glasses. Do you know how much glasses cost if you don't have insurance now? Whoa. So I'm talking to the lady. So very respectfully, I got to be careful because that's her time. She's working, right? But I find myself inside. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I don't know if she knows Christ. Lord, how do I ask her? Um, I'm a little nervous. But I, you just get out. You know, experience is kind of teach us how after a while. Guess what? She didn't come to Christ. But I don't know when she's going to do when she's not. But I just thought, all of a sudden, this love for her came out. I thought, man, I, I don't want her to be in the kitchen. Because she said, yeah, I, got some, I ask people five questions usually. You, you guys, you have evangelism training kind of stuff, I know. This is what I use, my tool. You know, you can put this tool in your pocket if you want to. Five questions I ask people. Hey, and, and, and they'll ask me what I do, which is always fun. It doesn't work very well when you're golfing with four people or th three other people who are not believers, though, right? Because we'll be like on the third or fourth hole, and they go, what do you do, Dave? And I say, well, I'm a missionary. Oh, man, sorry, I have my language, and, uh, you know, I talk about my wife, and uh, I'm sorry. They start apologizing all over. <laughs> and the game goes down from there, right? I'm the, I'm the only one having fun, because I... <laughs> who invited this guy? So, <laughs> but, you know, I ask five questions. I say, tell me what your spiritual beliefs are. And she said, I, I, she said, yeah, I, I have some. And, and I said, well, if you got time, I, I realize you're working. Love to hear. She didn't really want to go down that road, but uh, most times people do. 90% of the times they'll say, they'll tell me their spiritual beliefs. I just listen. I don't correct. I don't make a face. I'm interested. Then I'll ask them, who's Jesus to them? It's like, so you have all those. Well, who is Jesus to you? How does he fit in that picture? And I'll let them talk. Sometimes it sounds real Christian and they're not. Sometimes they are believers. Sometimes it's way off. I'll just let it go. So you believe in a heaven and a hell? You know what most people say? I believe in a heaven. What do you think about hell? I don't believe in hell. So I like that. I like that idea. Uh, it's ice cream every day. So... You know, I so said, you believe in heaven? Yeah, I believe in heaven, maybe not hell. And I said, well, where do you think you're going to go when you die? What do you think is going to happen after that? Well, I don't really know. And I said, well, if what you believe weren't true, would you want to know? Do you even want to know? And if they say yes, I'll just say, can I share with you, not my opinion, but some of the scripture? I open up scripture. I already have the pages marked. I have them read it. I just let them read it. And I watched their face turn. 
Because I'm not arguing with them. I, it's not my opinion. I just say, what does God say to you there? It's incredible sometimes. I did it with the guy who was in a church for 12 years, meeting in a small group, and I thought, something's not right. I just, I'm going to just ask him. We went through the whole thing. His name is George. I said, George, anybody ask you these questions before? He goes, no. I said, so, you know, we got to the end about Jesus and where you'd go. I said, have you ever settled that? No. I said, can I just show you? I just started, I just showed him. The, I didn't even read the text. I said, here, read that. I watched his face change. And he said, I want that. And the guys who were in a small group in the kitchen laughing, and all of a sudden they became quiet. And I said, George, you want to set something you want to settle right now? I said, yeah. So I, I don't, you know, pray invite Jesus into your life as your personal savior. I say, you know, he's asking you to change course. Recognize that you need him. That's called repentance. Just turn around and start chasing him. You want to do that? Yeah. You want to tell him? Yeah. And these guys came running out of the kitchen and they're going, did George just pray that prayer? I said, yeah. Well, he's been going to the church for 12 years. Yeah. Anybody ever ask him? No. Man, you never know. You're on mission every day. How do you stay motivated for it? You let the love of Christ compel you because he's not letting you go. He put up with you. He died for you. He's keeping you. He's changing you. Heaven's yours. This world's all going to be remade. It's all, all the stuff that is not going to be and it's going to be how he intended it. Don't live for it. And that's what he calls us to do. So it is, this, it is this motivation, the love and grace of God towards us through his son. How much it? Camp on that. What are the results when that happens? What happens when you allow this love? We love because he first loved us, the Bible says. So as that happens, what are the results? A fearless desire to surrender and serve him starts to grow. I'm with you. I've never had anybody love me like that. I've never had to make the promises you make who's able to keep them. And guess what, Lord? I don't, they're so great, I don't know that I fully trust you. But I'm going to take little steps. And over the years, that, those steps get a little braver and braver, and I start to grow in faith. What causes me to take those fearless steps? The love of Christ. The grace of God that he displayed through his son on the cross. It is the grace of God that's understood and then embraced that recruits and ignites the heart of man to serve and pursue Christ. That's what it is. It's not out of some obligation, not out of fear of or, you know, this thing that you want to achieve and be good. It's not out of fear that somehow you're not good enough and he's trying to get you to measure up or load guilt on you. It's out of the love and grace of Christ. C.S. Lewis walking into a room of theologians who are trying to look at the uniqueness of Christianity and they're talking about, well, it's in the resurrection. No, there's ancient stories of the resurrection. Uh, well, it's in the death on the cross. No, there's people who say they sacrifice for others. And no, it's God becoming a man. No, there's others who say they do that. And they were arguing back and forth about out of these, these um, English theologians and, and uh, Lewis walks into the room and he says, what's all the hubbub about? And they said, well, we're trying to find out what the one distinctive is with Christianity. He says, oh, that's easy. They said, well, what is it? He said, grace. It's a holy God who made everything. Who decided not to squish his, his image bearers and start over, but to redeem them at the cost of his son. I, I don't know a love like that anymore. So it starts to change us and it makes us fearless to just say, you are number one. Remember Isaiah in Isaiah 6? When he was there before the Lord in the throne and he saw him in all his glory and splendor and he fell down on his face as a dead man, didn't know what to do. He said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And so a seraphim comes from the throne, grabs it with a pair of tongs, these burning coals and puts it on Isaiah's lips and he says, you've been forgiven. I've made you right. And so then he hears the voice of the Lord from the throne say, who, who shall go for us and whom shall I send? And then Isaiah is able to say, here my sin me. I'm not afraid anymore because the one who made me, the one who could destroy me, loves me. Are you with me? Yeah. Does it like to help, help you, Jesus, or what? 
This is a logical response to the truth that your sins are removed and you've been granted eternal life. An urgency, secondly, the result is an urgency to participate in his mission. God does not involve us in this mission because he needs us. He involves us because he loves us. Isn't that a cool thing? You know, uh, Tozer wrote in his book, Knowledge of the Holy, he said, probably the hardest thought of all for our natural egotism to entertain is that God does not need our help. The God who works all things surely needs no help or no helpers. To many missionary appeals are based on this fancied frustration, uh, this fancied frustration of Almighty God. An effective speaker can easily excite pity in his hearers, Tozer says, not only for the heathen, but for the God who has tried so hard and so long to save them and has failed for want of support. I fear that thousands of young persons enter Christian service from no higher motive than to help deliver God from the embarrassing situation his love has gotten him into and his limited abilities seem unable to get him out of. God does not need you and me. But this powerful, loving ruler of the universe knows your name, your history, and says, come work with me. I'll be in you. That's powerful. So now, let's just look at the part of what that means in terms of what we do and for missions and how you can think about that. Because I believe the greatest change agent in the world is not a government or a government system. It's not voting the right people into power. It's not economy. It's not our brilliance. It's not just our, even our man-made compassion. The greatest, most powerful, powerful force for change in the world is the good news of Christ. It transforms lives. So can I just talk you through that for a minute? Because that's, when we talk about Africa and what we see, the need to disciple them and to bring the gospel to them is so big, we've got to do it through leaders. So we focus specifically on training pastors and, and government officials we work with and others. Why? Because Christ transforms their heart. Look, don't take this wrong. I, I mean, I, we, we're involved. We have connected ministries we're involved with. I think it's really good. In fact, I think it's necessary. But you can donate towards water wells and you can plant clean water in a place, you know, have it done. Because somewhere between 60 and 80% of all the world diseases are, are, have some kind of water connection, bad water born out of, out of they're born out of bad water. So when you go into a community and you bring this well, you, you start to change that community. It, it gets better, right? The whole thing starts to change. So it's a good thing. You bring medical aid into a community. You, it's a good thing. It can improve the health of the community. And you bring in um, education. It's a good thing. Well, I worked with orphans. It was basically education, and then we were developing trade schools. So when an orphan gets to be 17, 18, 19 years old, and they're now no longer under that care, and they're becoming an adult, where do they go? So we started to de uh, develop uh, this idea of discipling them through trade schools and helping giving them a vocation as they transition out, you know, um, into adulthood and where they go. And that was a good thing, and it, it becomes important. But... Um, Here's what we find, and, and sociologists who study this as well see this. Where evangelism and discipleship is emphasized through missionaries and local pastors in areas, everything improves. Education gets better. Health gets better. Water gets better. Leadership gets better. That's the power of the gospel. You know why? Because it changes the heart, not just the environment. And we see it powerfully done. Let me read to you an article. This is, from, this is from an atheist. This is back in 2008, Matthew Paris for the London Times or for the Times, he wrote an article called, As an Atheist, I Truly Believe Africa Needs God. But listen to, listen to what he says. He grew up in what's now called Malawi, which would just be south of uh, Tanzania or Tanzania. Um, 
And then he left and went back. And I think his parents were like missionary parents or something. So he had this awareness of Christ. Maybe he, he, he kind of went along with that for a while. But anyway, he became agnostic, atheist. He said, well, the, but the Times wanted me to go back and, and, and look at something called pump aid. It was clean water and stuff to the area, right? So he's going to go back and he's going to look at it. And I wanted to see the work and, and then I was going to write about it. He says, it inspired me, renewing my flagging faith in developing charities. It confounds my ideological beliefs, though, stubbornly refuses to fit my worldview and has embarrassed my growing belief that there is no God. Now he's talking about not just pump aid. He's talking about believers there and the impact that they were having. Now as a confirmed atheist, Paris says, I've become convinced of the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa. Sharply distinct from the work of secular NGOs, non-governmental organizations, government projects, and international aid efforts. Education and training alone will not do, he says. In Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts. It brings a spiritual transformation. The rebirth is real, and the change is good. It goes on to say, and I'll just read you the last part. Those who want Africa to walk tall amid the 21st century global competition must not kid themselves that providing the material means or even the know-how uh, that accompanies what we call development will make a change. A whole belief system must first be supplanted. Removing Christian, Christian evangelism from the African equation may leave the continent at the mercy of a malign fusion of Nike, the witch doctor, the mobile phone, and the machete. That's from an atheist. That, he said, you know what he's saying? I'm not thinking, dude, what's holding you back? He's just saying the transforming work of Christ is changing the whole environment as it changes the hearts of people. I, my oldest son, trains SWAT officers and works with a security group, goes around the country. He's, he's a little danger ranger. Oh, he's, he's a big man, but uh, his best friend w works uh, is with the Naval Special Forces in the, what's called the development group of the SEALs. So when he goes overseas, I, I say to him, hey, just give me a text and tell me you have to go to work out of town so I'll know to pray for you, right? So I'm praying for him and he texts me and I happen to be in West Africa and I know he can't tell me where he is but he's probably in probably in the northeast part of Africa so he tells me where he is and, and I said man thanks for what you're doing I know it's dangerous you're leaving your family you're, you're among a bunch of bad people he said yeah it's it's not good there's some real evil here and um, he's a just committed believer uh, but a professional and he said um, but thank you for what you do. And I said, yeah, I know you gotta say that, you know. Um, you gotta respect me, which you should. And uh, he, he, he said, no, I, Dave, I'm being serious. And then we started talking, we talked on the phone. And I said, well, what did you mean by that? He said, I'll tell you. I go to some of the worst places in the world. We see groups and different people. He, I, I, I'm telling you seriously, and this is not in the news, the real heroes and the light that we see that brings change are where there are small Christian churches and pastors and missionaries who are bringing the gospel. And he said it changes everything. The evil starts to subside. The good starts to raise up. You carry that in you. That's what we do. I would love to have you join us at some point. Now, um, I, I wish I could give you more. I'm going to give you a couple of real uh, quick ones. Mel and I were in our, our international council. We were in Togo. It's West Africa, small little strip country. And one of the new guys on our team that came to join us uh, is uh, and works with ICM in Niger. Or, you know, some people pronounce it Niger, but we're in the U.S. So he's from Niger. His name is, uh, um, I don't know if we have a slide of him, if we don't. Just imagine me black and handsome. And uh, <laughs> I'm not going to try the accent. 
His name is Mokhtar Sulmana. Mokhtar is the son of a chief. And um, Mokhtar came to Christ when he was in about college age, about like I did. And um, Muslim family. Didn't want his family to find out about it, so he, he, uh, he stayed away in college. His family found out about it. His dad and his uncle came to try to bring him back. Talk to him about you know, his need to, to restore his Islamic faith and come back to the family. And he said, no, I can't do that. He, his dad then came back a second time and said, you know, look, you can, I'll tell you what, you know, I see that you're in earnest with this. You can keep your Christian beliefs, your Jesus. Just keep it to yourself. Come back, pray in the mosque, do the stuff that we do. He said, I can't do that. I won't deny Christ. I said, he's, he's changed me. He's loved me. And so his dad said, you're no longer my son. And you're out of the family. You know what Mokhtar does now? He tra- he's had, had training and, and he works alongside with us. He now trains pastors and people in different churches to go to the Muslim areas around them because the country is 95% Muslim and to, and to plant themselves there and to make churches and they're doing it on their own they're, and they're giving them biblical training and these people are reaching them faster than we ever could. Now, I'm not opposed to pe- God will still call some of us out of this culture to prepare, train ourselves, and to go live the rest of our lives in another one or the majority of our life. That still should happen. But what we see some of the most effective, what we're doing in missions now is we're training these leaders because they're reaching their near neighbors faster than we ever could. They know the language, they know the culture, and they know Jesus, and they're ready to die for him. And they're transforming a country. It's pretty darn incredible just to watch, and they love him. Good ending to that story. Mokhtar had a conversation with his dad who came back after about seven years and said, with his uncle, and said, we have, we have done, we have exercised things against you that you don't even know about. And we have not seen, uh, we see nothing but good and not trouble. They wished trouble for him. They kind of like, you know, did the, the mojo heebie-jeebie on him and nothing happened and, <laughs> did all, and, and, and tried to get people to turn against them. And his, here's what his dad said. Your Jesus cannot be changed. And he gave his life to Christ. Isn't that cool? So I'll tell you one more. I was supposed to land the plane two minutes ago. Can you guys just allow me one little quick one? Because maybe it's the other campus that's going to suffer. But okay, yeah. So let me just tell you another one because I really love this lady. I don't even know her. I just talk about her, but I've met her. Her name is Rachel. She's in Ghana. And uh, we do, we have another program, and and Mel can tell you about it, called Discipling Marketplace Leaders. So we work and help train people for business development, people with small businesses. Rachel was one of those. She was a Muslim, came to Christ, didn't want her family to find out about it. Uh, About two weeks before that, by the way, a 22-year-old man who came to Christ, his family found out about it. His dad poisoned his food and killed him. So Rachel came to Christ, and she didn't want her family to find out about it. Her dad did. He disowned her. She's the oldest of three daughters, no brothers, nobody to support her, no husband. She's out. Church starts watching, helping take care of her. And she goes through this training. And she starts a little, what we call a dukkha, you know, a little store in this neighborhood. It was dry goods and a few perishables. And, and uh, she goes through the training. She has a business plan. She gets a mentor. She got access to capital. Some of the money that we loan went to her. By the way, after and uh, all the people that are over there, we have it tightly managed through Christians in that country. In three and a half years, we have a zero default rate. These, these men and women are thriving. They're paying back the loans. They're doing the things. And they're being, and what we train them is not in business. We train them to be disciples of Christ. She has a little comic book gospel, right? Kids are coming home from school by her store out, afterwards. I'm there talking with her. I don't, I can't tell how old she is. 27 to 34. I don't know. She could be 60. I don't know. So, she. So I, I'm listening to her talk about it, and she's going, yeah, I'm sharing Christ with these kids, and these kids are coming to Christ. You know what my thought was? Well, you're going to get in trouble. So I was really brave, right? And um, here's this, the leader coming in and going, oh, I don't know if you should be doing that. And so, so here's the power of Christ, though, right? A month and a half after I left, the, these areas and these neighborhoods have leaders, chiefs, and that area is a Muslim chief. A month and a half after I left, they told me that she led the chief to the Lord. This little timid woman. So now, those people, Mokhtar, Rachel, they're no different than you and me. But they're gripped by the love of Christ, and they're fearless. And my challenge to you is to be the same. 
do not take for granted the love of Christ. Let it rule in your heart. Let it drive you fearlessly to take it to other people. Learn all you can. Be conformed to his image. Love your enemy as well as your neighbor and the people in your family. And walk humbly and in due time. He will lift you up and lift up this church. God bless you guys as you serve him.